So I think now you got the first remark about how to go forward with that. And as I said, as we elaborated this morning already, um, training in this environment will be really vital going forward. And uh, I think uh, EFAS is really on the forefront and we are going to develop the program on an annual basis and also expanding it uh, geographically where this is, this is necessary. Um, now I would like to come to the, to the next point uh, of the agenda, which is what is going on in carbon markets. Uh, and I'm just wondering, yeah, Leo's already there. Great. Leo, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Great. Hi, Hi everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for, for having you. Uh, Leo Mongrende is the senior manager at KPMG International. And um, besides that, he's also the carbon pricing and market lead of KPMG's global decarbonization hub. And he has more than 15 years experience in this very interesting field. And uh, he has a lot of experience with including carbon project development and also with uh, Article 6 transaction under Paris alignment uh, background and advising large international corporations on their net zero strategy. We all know that this is even more important going forwards, direction 2030 and 40. And uh, last but not least, also to secure long-term supply of high-quality credits. And uh, Leo, we are glad to have you here and give us a bit of an insight what is going on in that market, which was uh, largely neglected for a long period of time. Uh, also the price development of carbon, uh, but I think the last two years have been shown really spurring this development and especially the interest in the carbon markets. So I think therefore, as carbon reduction is the name of the game and will be the name of the game of the E in ESG, going forward, especially taking all the net zero initiatives into consideration, uh, you are ideally suited to give us sort of an idea uh, what's going on and what do we have to take care about. So please give us a heads up. Thank you very much and uh, good uh, afternoon. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, let's talk about carbon market and carbon pricing instruments. So I will skip. Sorry. I'll skip the introduction and go straight to, uh, to the menu of, of this session. So obviously like covering carbon market and carbon pricing instrument in uh, 30 minutes is a bit of a wishful thinking. So I'll, I casted the, the net pretty wide and I will provide some uh, insight and, and latest trend on all the, the various like declination of carbon pricing instrument. Some aspects I guess will be uh, maybe trivial or easy for some of you. So bear with me, but I'm pretty convinced that everyone will, uh, will learn at least something today. So we'll start with some introduction on carbon pricing instrument, talk about ETS and carbon tax schemes, uh, latest developments, talk about internal carbon pricing, carbon crediting mechanism, and then obviously uh, the voluntary carbon market, which is making quite the headlines for the past two, three years. And I'd like to finish that session with a few concepts that uh, I'd like to share with you because I'm discussing this very often with clients and, and colleagues. So let's get started. Um, first, why carbon pricing and why pricing carbon is, is necessary? Um, and I guess this question is, is becoming, uh, is, is answering itself like more and more, uh, especially after the, the summer that we've, we've gone through with, uh, you know, massive drought, heat waves, uh, wildfires, and also it's, it's quite clear now in 2022 that CO2 emissions are negative externality and it's important to consider, integrate them in any investment decision. Carbon pricing is also important for achieving the goal that we set forth and we agreed upon uh, when it comes to, uh, to the Paris Agreement and you know, limiting the, the global warming. It's important to stimulate investment in, in uh, clean technology. And uh, last but not least, it's also a massive source of revenues for uh, government and states. So to give you a sense, like uh, uh, all CPI combined in 2021, managed to generate 84 billion uh, US uh, dollars. So uh, quite significant. So when it comes to um, the pricing instrument available, I guess we can uh, split them in four main uh, categories, uh, carbon taxes, ETS, internal carbon pricing and crediting mechanism. The first two carbon taxes and ETS are uh, typically regional, national and, and subnational. Uh, they are different in nature and, and design. Carbon taxes will be um, 
designed by government uh, that will set the rules in terms of which uh, what will be the coverage and uh, decide on like a price point and then after the market uh, will dictate the, the the level of emission reduction that will be achieved obviously there is a clear incentive for uh, companies and entities uh, within the the mandate of the carbon tax to, uh, to reduce to pay less tax at the end of the day. ETS also called uh, cap and trades uh, work a bit uh, differently. The government also decide on the, the sector that will be covered as well as the total uh, emission uh, that, that should be em emitted. And then companies uh, within the, the scope of, of uh, the ETS uh, can emit their free uh, uh, allowances, but if they emit more, they need to uh, to um, uh, procure auctions, uh, procure sorry allowances through auction or through trading with other companies that are uh, them emitting less. So there is also a, a good incentive here. Um, when it comes to internal carbon pricing, this is mostly um, you know a, a, a mechanism that's uh, implemented by companies as a way to uh, well put a price on carbon and uh, take that into consideration and drive positive chance. So uh, the reason for implementing uh, internal carbon pricing are many, uh, mostly to reduce uh, emission, of, of course, to um, estimate climate risk going forward to future-proof companies, uh, and also for very likely upcoming disclosure requirements. Uh, ICPs at the moment come in roughly two flavors, uh, shadow cost, which is um, essentially, the company will um, agree on an internal carbon price, but this will be theoretical. There will there won't be any transaction within the company, but rather uh, use that as a way to um, evaluate and assess uh, future investment. For instance, to to uh, to consider the externality uh, into the into the decision making. Uh, the other the other flavor is internal tax fees. Uh, levy or, or, or trading system, and in that case, there is actual transaction, and the proceed of this uh, this transaction is usually a mark for um, decarbonization purposes. For instance, um, last but not least, carbon uh, carbon crediting mechanism, which is uh, by nature either like national or international, are uh, mechanism that are designed to uh, to reduce GHG emission. They are usually um, governed by by standards and uh, methodologies that are doing GHG accounting between a baseline scenario and a project scenario and estimates the the volume of uh, uh, GHG uh, what well, carbon emissions either like reduced or sequestered and uh, issue credits uh, accordingly they can be uh, as I said like national so uh, UK Woodland Code is for instance uh, an example uh, or international everyone has, uh, has you know heard of article 6 of the Paris agreement uh, the voluntary carbon market is also uh, another uh, international example um, question are the current carbon pricing instruments sufficient uh, the short answer is no at this point in time we only have roughly a quarter of global emission currently covered by some form of CPI uh, the good news, the relatively good news, is that uh, the trend is clearly on the up and there is a growing share of these emissions that are covered and this share has tripled in the last decade. So you've seen that uh, little visual, the number of both the coverage and um, the number of CPI being implemented uh, globally. Next question is, are the prices currently applied high enough? Uh, and while we are seeing uh, clearly an upward trend, Especially when looking at like the voluntary capital market, for instance, that is is booming and growing uh, in a crazy fashion, um, the prices are still too low to uh, to be meaningful. At this point in time, we only have about four percent of the share of global emission that is currently covered by some by um, a carbon price that will fall within an appropriate range. And by appropriate range. I refer to uh, the carbon price corridor that was established by the High Commission on Carbon Prices that's uh, being led by uh, Stern and Stiglitz and essentially um, established that, um, you know, if we are to, to meet the, um, the Paris Agreement target, carbon prices uh, should be ranging anywhere between $50 and $100 a ton uh, by 2030. And that's like further uh, supported by the IMF that's advocating uh, a carbon price of $75 a ton by, by the end of the decade. 
Um, few words on ETS and, uh, and carbon taxes scheme. Um, so this is a very nice map that I borrowed from, uh, by the way, the World Bank State and Trends report on carbon pricing 2022. If you haven't read this report, I'm convinced that like uh, some of you are, are, are well aware of it. But if you haven't, like, please uh, have a read. I contributed personally in the, the development of the 2021 version. Um, and I think that like, this map is is um, you know telling everything and shows exactly where the, the various instruments are, are being implemented. Uh, uh, Europe is is a bit on the leading edge in terms of, of coverage, in terms of um, you know uh, complexity in the in the various schemes that are uh, operating in, in parallel. Uh, last year, or and, and this year actually, a limited number of uh, of CPI have emerged. Uh, I think four, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and there are uh, so 68 in um, currently uh, ongoing and three that are uh, planned and scheduled for implementation, actually including one, if I'm not mistaken, in Austria. Um, I think like the main, you know, the main, you know, large development, every development is a, a positive, you know, a step in the, in, in the right direction. But I think one of the main uh, and most notable developments in the recent years is the implementation of the Chinese ETS, which, given the sheer scale of the country and, and emission covered, uh, has become, uh, you know, de facto the largest uh, um, carbon market when it comes to, uh, to, uh, to emission covered. So this is definitely a good, uh, a good step. Um, few words on, on the EU ETS. Um, this is the, the longest lasting uh, such uh, ETS scheme and also the largest market by traded value uh, last year. Uh, 15 billion EUAs were, were traded on the IC, the, the largest secondary market platform. Um, we reach uh, record high um, prices in 2022. Uh, I believe the record was 98 uh, euro ton in, uh, in August, so quite recently. Um, and in 2021, revenue generated by this scheme alone uh, was valued at $34 billion. Uh, so the UETS is covering uh, the largest emitting sectors in, in the EU, which are electricity and heavy, uh, heavy industry, emission intensive industry and, and, and sectors, as well as aviation for intra-European Union uh, flight only. Um, there are some talks in strengthening the UETS for like further coverage, including in the maritime sector. So taking maritime sector into, uh, into consideration and building new ETS for building and road uh, transport uh, fuels. Uh, in addition, uh, and, and, and focusing on, on Europe, so Europe has pledged to reduce emission by 55% by the end of the decade, uh, based uh, on uh, levels in the 1990s, uh, and you know, with the aim of, of reaching uh, net zero by 2050. Uh, this package of measures is called European Green Deal. Again, I'm sure everyone has heard of it, but I highlighted the three points I had a few points here, but I had in particular three points which will have impact, I believe, uh, in, in carbon market. The first one mentioned already is the inclusion of uh, the maritime sector in the scope starting next year already, and uh, the, the, um, the development of a separate ETS uh, for buildings and, and road transport, the phasing out of reallocation for the aviation sector, and probably the most important and the biggest uh, the biggest world to date is the introduction of a new mechanism called Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, CBAM, that will aim to price imported goods based on their emissions starting in 2026. And I'd like to take just uh, a bit more time on uh, providing a bit more insight on that. Uh, so CBAM is essentially a mechanism that is designed to uh, combat carbon leakage. Um, and by carbon leakage is creating uh, a level playing field between uh, industries in, that are operating in the EU and industries that are operating in jurisdiction where emission related legislation and regulation are weaker, um, but that are being imported within the EU. Uh, so making a, a level playing field here by uh, imposing um, uh, you know, the purchase of certificates uh, Corresponding to the the delta in terms of of, uh, of emission there uh, at the import uh, at the import of uh, of, of goods, um, so this is a mechanism that uh, is still in negotiation, but is is meant to be 
starting in 2023 already for an initial period of familiarization. So for, for the first three years, it will be reporting only at this point uh, and gradually um, free allowances will be withdrawn uh, on, on an annual basis until we reach uh, 2032 where the, the scheme will be uh, fully enforced. So given CBAM is, is a mirror uh, mechanism to, uh, to the UETS, uh, the sector covered are not surprising. So you will uh, find the same sectors that the UTS is already uh, uh, covering. There are discussion on additional sector as well, uh, including in hydrogen, organic chemicals and plastics, uh, but is yet being uh, discussed. A um, few words on internal carbon pricing now uh, and a few insights. So internal carbon pricing by nature is, well, at this point in time, is not something that is being uh, highly disclosed because that's an internal measure. So some companies are very vocal about it, but some are not so much. But luckily, we have uh, an initiative called uh, CDP, the Climate Disclosure Project that runs a regular survey across uh, entire sectors. Um, this is uh, at this point in time of, you know, on, on voluntary basis, but with this process, we can start already collecting um, data, insights and, and lesson learned. And some of the, the feedback we're getting are, are, are positive. For instance, um, there's a 80% increase in, in number of companies that are using or planning to use an ICP in, in, the, in the five years between 2015 and 2020. Um, we are seeing, though, that there is still a majority of uh, respondents that are applying a shadow price, so the theoretical version, so to say, of, of the ICP, um, while a, a lower portion of uh, respondents are already uh, taking it a step further and, and implementing like internal transaction. Uh, in terms of like the price point, the, the height, so to say, of the um, of the internal carbon price uh, set by companies, we are mostly falling um, under the carbon price corridor I mentioned um, I mentioned earlier. So that's the case for like seventy percent of the company that have been uh, have been uh, surveyed and have answered the survey. Rather, um, we have eighteen percent of the the answer uh, of the the respondent that are falling within the right uh, carbon price corridor and fewer than 100 companies that are uh, applying a higher uh, internal carbon price. So at the bottom of the, the slide, you see um, kind of a breakdown by sectors um, that, that shows the median price and only uh, the apparel sector is uh, showing uh, a price point that is within the appropriate range. Um, this is to be taken with a grain of salt because again, that's just like a very small portion of like all companies and some of the sectors have uh, less uh, data point than, than others, but uh, that's therefore just illustrative. Um, carbon crediting mechanism. Um, so this is quite complex and uh, I think, or I hope um, this slide will uh, make a bit more sense because they are like very, very different version of credit of carbon crediting mechanism, both in terms of like scale mandate and, and, and what to, uh, to operate as well as different um, source of demands. And I think that lately the lines are also blurring uh, where you are seeing like compliance grade uh, type of markets accepting voluntary grade type of credit and, and vice versa. But um, Roughly speaking, we have three types of crediting mechanisms. So international, so think about the UNFCCC, like clean development mechanism or Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. Uh, you have regional, national and subnational. Think about California compliance offset program, uh, RGGI in the US and then independent. So that's everything that kind of relates to the, the VCM. So uh, VERA VCS, gold standard, uh, ACR, uh, CR, and uh, there are uh, a lot of, of, of standard, independent standards there. And when it comes to the segments, uh, you have fair form main one, uh, international compliance market. Uh, so that's for countries and DC target, but also for uh, sector, uh, compliance sector uh, demand, uh, Corsia, <clears throat> which is the carbon offset reduction scheme for international aviation. Um, uh, is also uh, a source of demand, or will become rather a future source of demand for for, for, for such credit. Domestic compliance markets, uh, so carbon taxes and ETS that I mentioned earlier, some of them are using uh, 
credit as part of their or like credit from from this type of, of uh, crediting mechanism as part of their eligible uh, units uh, at least a share of them uh, result-based finance and then last but not least the the voluntary carbon market which i'll spend a tiny bit more time to, uh, to talk about um, so the vcm um, vcm in number in 2021 uh, massive massive year um, almost $2 billion uh, in, uh, in, traded, uh, in traded value, uh, which is uh, almost 300% year-on-year growth compared to, uh, to 2020, uh, which was already itself quite a, a growth from 2019, so it's not uh, that COVID made 2021 look bad. Um, so not only a large increase in terms of uh, volume transacted, but also and that's a good sign as well, uh, an increase of uh, the price that are being fetched. And that's a bit a, a result of the market squeeze we are seeing uh, for a few years and that, are, that is becoming more and more uh, acute uh, today. So, you know, roughly speaking, I think we can say that like up until 2017, apart from like very specific segment of the VCM, the market was very much um, a, a buyer's market, and that has turned into a seller's market with the emergence of all the net zero carbon neutrality uh, pledges. So there are segments now in the market that are really high in demand, very little supply, and therefore uh, higher prices, and the need to rethink um, how to participate in that market. Um, I think that's what I'm trying to, uh, to convey with this uh, slide, essentially. Uh, essentially saying that um, in the market, in the VCM market today, either you take, uh, if you are serious, uh, and that's the case for, you know, corporates that are committing to long-term uh, uh, climate, uh, climate pledges, uh, if you are serious and you want to avoid to find yourself in, in, a, in a situation where you're struggling for, for supply, where you're struggling to, um, you know, have a, a good oversight on your uh, uh, on your cost, then you need to take a proactive stance because uh, there are an increasingly growing share of companies that are committing to some form of, of net zero targets. So net zero are not all equal, but luckily we are moving toward a bit of a consensus on that. But uh, for a majority of them, there will be uh, you know, a requirement for some supply of, of, of credits, uh, if anything, for the neutralization of residual emission. Um, there are some serious bottlenecks, especially on the removal side of the market. I will talk about these two different sides in, in a minute, uh, <clears throat> but that's definitely something to keep in mind. The trends in this first half of the year in 2022, we are seeing uh, a bit of a, a slowdown in terms of, of the, the issuance level compared to 2021. Um, that can be explained by various reasons, probably the the, the context at the moment is uh, is a bit um, a bit tricky. Um, there are a lot of uh, players that had entered into the market uh, in 2021 that are now taking more of, um, um, you know they are more like looking to see what's what's going to happen and also there is still some level of uncertainty when it comes to uh, regulation from host country where you know all of this uh, this this project are being implemented. Um, something that doesn't change at this point in time, the market is still in terms at least uh, uh, of, of insurance, the, the market is still very much dominated by, uh, by two types of credit, avoidance, nature-based solution and renewable energy activities. So that's almost 80% of the market for these first six months um, and a very limited supply of, of, of removal. Um, so only 13 million ton issued for this first six months. So to give you an example, I worked uh, a few years ago for uh, an airline and we did some, you know, GIG accounting for their uh, emission and their emission was ranging, it was 2019, so pre-COVID, but their emission was ranging between eight and 10 million ton um, a year. So to give you a perspective, that one airline, if they were to, uh, to neutralize this, uh, this emission, uh, they will essentially like uh, sweep out the entire uh, removal market. Um, I'd like to finish the, the session on a few concepts uh, that I think are, are worth talking about uh, and that I find, uh, you know, I come across again and again. And the first one, this one is for me like the greatest misconception today. 
carbon neutrality and net zero are two different things. And, you know, it might be obvious to you, um, but there are still, in my experience, a majority of people that kind of like use the terms uh, somehow uh, for what they believe is the same things, so why that's clearly not the case. So um, just take a second for understanding what's commonly understood as carbon neutrality, uh, at least by companies. Um, essentially, companies are emitting uh, emission, right? But this emission will normally like tend to like decrease over time due to uh, improvements in uh, in efficiency development of new uh, of new uh, innovative processes new fuels whatever so that will tend to, to decrease over time but uh, we don't put like stringent decarbonization requirements and on a yearly basis uh, the company does their GRG accounting and purchase and retire an equivalent amount of, of carbon credit offsets and there is just no regulation on the type of offset that are being used. There is no regulation on like um, the vintage of the offset being used, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what a lot of companies, a lot of corporates uh, still kind of believe in. And for me, I, I'd like to warn them that this kind of paradigm is, is coming to an end very soon, I believe. Um, so therefore, what, what is net zero? What does it mean? And what's the difference between both? Well, in a net zero situation, the company first and foremost goal will be to decarbonize drastically and reduce their emission and their pathway need to be grounded in science and aligned with uh, a 1.5c scenario if, if possible. So the company will work really hard in decarbonization until they reach a target here that they will have set themselves, at which point they only are allowed to uh, emit so-called residual emissions. So this level of residual emission will uh, be different depending on the kind of sector you're operating in. Um, and in order to uh, validate this, uh, this net zero, the company needs to, um, to neutralize this residual emission with carbon removal credits. So to, com to counterbalance and sequester a, a, an equivalent amount of, of CO2 that they are, uh, they are still emitting. Um, companies are also encouraged, but this is optional at this point in time, to take further climate action by uh, using and implementing beyond value chain mitigation measures. And that's like the lighter green part uh, in, in, in that visual here. Just a slide on avoidance and removal. And again, uh, you know, apologies if uh, you are very familiar with that, but uh, I see so much confusion that uh, I thought was worth mentioning. Um, there are three types of credits. There is the avoidance and the removal. The avoidance is, uh, think about uh, a solar plant, like a renewable energy plant, whereby you implement a renewable energy plants in a country that is traditionally powered by fossil fuel plants. And you are producing an equivalent amount of electricity with no emission. You are therefore like decreasing the, 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 emission, uh, the, the emission factor of, of the grid. And under certain circumstances, the developer can actually claim credits for that. So that's like the brighter, uh, the brighter, the pink uh, part of, of, of the visual. On the other hand, removal are uh, projects that are designed to capture and sequester permanently CO2. Uh, they come in, in, in two types, uh, natural based solutions, and as the name implies, are, oh, oops, sorry natural-based um, and tech-based. So think about, uh, so for when it comes to natural-based, like reforestation, afforestation, uh, but also blue carbon. So uh, mangrove, for instance, like reforestation of mangrove is uh, one that is being talked about quite a lot. And when it comes to tech-based, uh, direct air capture is probably like the, the easiest example. So both of these type of credits are uh, eligible for different aspects of a net zero, uh, a net zero pathway. So removal, as I mentioned, is mandatory and that's for neutralization of, of residual emission, while avoidance can be used for beyond value chain mitigation. By the way, removal can also be used for that. Um, and perhaps it's a good idea to start, you know, lining up a supply of, of removal credit in the, in the process reaching uh, net zero uh, to make sure that you know, a company has the, 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 the right amount of, of, um, of removal available, but uh, at this point in time, they are scarcer, they are, uh, yeah, they are more expensive. So 
it's expected that the majority of beyond value chain mitigation will be tackled through uh, through avoidance uh, at this point in time. Um, the good news is that there is um, uh, quite um, quite a landscape of uh, frameworks and guidance that that have been issued. So they are either like ongoing or have recently been issued and are in public consultation. Um, the first one is obviously the corporate net zero standard that essentially set the scene. So the SBTI, the Science Based Target Initiative, has become a bit of the consensus on on that matter. Um, and their corporate net zero standard set the scene for what should be done in terms of like decarbonization and reaching uh, a net zero. Uh, the SBTI is also working on a series of target setting guidance specific to a uh, to, uh, to each sector, um, it's a uh, work in progress for some of them. And the first uh, guidance documents have been issued for a few uh, sector, including the financial sector. So this was, I believe, last month. Um, and if you, have, if, if you have another chance to like uh, have a look, uh, definitely uh, suggest to, uh, to read it. It's quite substantial, it's 180 pages, if I'm not wrong, but uh, definitely worth it. Um, and there are two, two other like draft guidance that are worth uh, mentioning. Uh, one by that are they both are tackling market integrity. One from the men's side, the the VCMI guidance that regulates or aims to regulate corporate claims. So what can be uh, claim you know a legitimate claim for for a corporate uh, player and guidance on the use of offset in particular for this beyond value chain mitigation part. And the ICVCM look at the supply side and carbon credit quality and environmental integrity. So just a quick recap. Um, uh, these are the three entry points in the voluntary carbon market. If you are uh, a company, the financial you know, institution or, or whatever, first and foremost, decarbonize and secure uh, a pipeline, a supply of removal credit for neutralization of your residual emission from the moment you reach target here. But also um, consider um, consider compensation of unavailable emission in the transition period, and there is the possibility to 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 uh, have legitimate carbon neutrality claim under certain uh, circumstances, which include, for instance, being fully on track and disclosing on a yearly basis uh, progress made in the decarbonization pathway. So you can not only decarbonize, but also compensate for what's going on still in the process and claim carbon neutrality before reaching a net zero state. Uh, and last, um, which is something that like uh, a few companies are, are already uh, considering or implementing, which is compensation for historical emission. Uh, and uh, Microsoft is, is a good, good example of that. Uh, essentially, Microsoft was launched in 1975 and they, they've done some GAG accounting of the, the impact done over the years, and they want to take action uh, on that. Um, last, uh, yeah, I'd like to finish um, on a bit of a uplifting note and a bit of a hopeful note, and maybe something that will be, uh, uh, you know, speaking to you. Um, I, I strongly believe that uh, while the VCM can be seen, you know, voluntary carbon market and all of this regulation can be seen. As a necessity, but can also be seen as as an opportunity, uh, especially for for financial players. Um, and that's just an example of like um, a structure uh, a structure that could work because we are in a situation where you you, you can have two type of, of actors on let's say the investment and structuring front, uh, the the financer that is you know ready to um, to mobilize capital and is in the market for for return, and on the other hand, you have um, the corporates that um, you know have committed to a, a long term long term target, and therefore require you know a secure su supply. And there is like a bit of a matchmaking that that could be considered, and, and in fact, that is being considered already. I worked on a, a few transactions of that nature uh, because the company you know can have their own requirements and their own uh, needs for the future but they're, they're also often part of a broader ecosystem of partners suppliers subsidiaries that will all have their own requirements so they could also become um, a bit of a supplier to to their, their network their ecosystem and in case there is surplus that is being generated by the investment vehicle let's say 
carbon fund of some sort, uh, there is always the possibility to go to the, the brokering route. Here I mentioned brokering partner, but if you are a financing partner um, with a trading desk, you could probably play that role as well. Uh, and there is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a growing uh, volume of, um, of uh, companies that are committing and therefore will require one way or another uh, supply of, of credit going forward. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leo. Are there any questions from the audience here in Vienna? Rene. I have a direct question to, um, to Leo, um, if possible. Um, what do you think um, about investors investing in CO2 certificates uh, with an underlying on CO2 futures, which is based on, on available EU certificates? Is that positive? Is it negative? Does it have an impact? Uh, what, what is your take on this? So, so um, yeah, and uh, maybe I didn't understand. So, like, financiers like investing in CO2 certificates that will have an underlying in the UETS? Yes. So basically, I, I create a structure product, which okay. takes the price of the of the the CO2, of the carbon price of, of the European carbon price. Uh, to be very honest with you, my area of expertise is more on the VCM. So um, all the structure I've uh, contributed to are uh, VCM based, so not so much for compliance markets. So I'm not sure I'm the right person to, uh, to answer that. But like, if you want, we can take it offline and uh, you know, just drop me a line and I can put you in touch with colleagues that may be in a better position to, uh, to address that question because all the as I said, like the transaction I, I worked on, they were for a uh, voluntary target and they're like net zero, not so much, uh, you know, generating like future compliance grade uh, credits. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much, Leo. Are there any further questions here from the audience? Are there any questions from the online? Yeah, there were. Uh, one question, but uh, we answered this this morning already, but just for, for clarification's sake, uh, don't you worry. Uh, all the presentations which are available uh, will be sent by the end of next week, also with the link uh, of the overall recordings of today. Yeah, so the whole day was recorded and will be recorded and you will get all a link next week. And this link contains then uh, the direct connection to the um, recorded data and also to the uh, responsible and, and respective presentation involved. Yeah, so that everybody can have a look at it at their spare time for their own convenience. Leo, you see uh, that a lot of uh, uh, respect and a lot of requests in this, in this very uh, uh, tedious topic and very important for all of us going forward on the ESG side. So therefore, thanks, thank you very much for shed a light on this very uh, uh, problematic topic, which is very much detailed and where you gave us a real insight. So thank you very much for your effort. No, no worries. Thank you very much. And I saw a few questions uh, and I invite, because uh, like, I guess we don't have time to like take the question, but I invite uh, everyone to reach out. Um, you have my name, so you can like uh, find me on LinkedIn or whatever. And I'm happy to uh, take some of these questions further. I saw one about like whether or not companies should claim carbon neutrality. And uh, I think that needs a few minutes to, uh, to answer and we might not have the time, but like feel free to reach out. Great. There was one last minute question coming in and was saying, Leo, uh, would you say companies should not claim that they are climate neutral? Yeah, that's that's one of the great questions, I think. And that's what I was trying to uh, to tackle when I, I try to make the distinction between carbon neutrality and net zero. Uh, the short answer to that is that they should definitely claim carbon neutrality, but only and really only if and that's the big if if they are engaged and can substantiate that they are engaged in a net zero pathway, meaning that the first point of consideration for a company today is to decarbonize, disclose, and make ev like use every possible effort 
to decarbonize and reduce their, their emissions, scope one, two, and three, to a, an amount that is uh, appropriate and aligned with the SBTI guidance. On top of that, if they want to claim carbon neutrality, um, um, they can do so if they are aligned. And under certain circumstances, that the VCMI, so the Voluntary Carbon Market in, uh, Integrity Initiative, uh, as, uh, as proposed, then the, the carbon neutrality claim is legitimate and can be taken seriously. If, however, a company, um, you know, go for a carbon neutrality claim without substantiating that they are making every possible effort, not only making every possible effort, but that they are disclosing and, and providing evidence that um, they are in line to meet their target, the target that they've set for themselves, then if they don't do that, they are, in, in, in my view, in a very high risk, reputational risk to being accused of like greenwashing and just like paying for offsets to, to continue business as usual. And that's a massive, massive reputational risk and, 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 and you know, liability for companies. Uh, I, I worked in, in the past for, for a few companies that were um, considering this kind of, of, uh, of initiatives and I, I helped them reconsider because at the end of the day, all of this cost, all of these efforts will be for nothing if they are being, uh, you know, fully criticized on, on the press, on the media, and, and, and there is no credibility in just, um, in just like doing direct offsetting without taking the steps to decarbonize. Okay, great. And there was a final question on the slide 28 concerning the VCM landscape. And the, the question was, uh, and the supply bottlenecks you mentioned, where do you see possible solution to overcome uh, this bottleneck or these problems you mentioned? Uh, bottleneck, uh, that was mostly, yeah, that relates to like the removal side of the market and some sectors of the avoidance side. Um, the issue at this point in time is that um, we were in a market that was suppressed for many, many years. There was virtually no money for replanting trees. There was just no uh, commercial incentive to do so for a long period of time. Um, therefore, for a long period of time, there were no projects. All of a sudden, you, from like 2017, 2018, 2019 onward, you start to have lots of pledges and therefore a lot of demand. But the reality is that when it comes to the removal side, we are talking about natural based solution because the tech based one are not ready yet or not at scale. Um, we are talking simply about trees that are growing and you are planting a sapling. It will take 10, 15 years before it actually like, reach uh, the scale and the maturity. So what is required to, uh, to uh, um, you know, overcome some of these bottleneck, further investment, further work in identifying uh, location um, further uh, work also in R and D on the on the tech side because there are like uh, th there is hope on that side as well. There are there are some uh, innovative technologies that that are starting to uh, you know show uh, hopes. Uh, thinking about like a few, uh, they used to be startups, but now they are like raising hundreds of millions. Uh, Climeworks is is a good example of uh, of of the likes. Um, there was also like a shortage of. Uh, widely approved methodology uh, internationally uh, that will make the, the issuance of credits uh, credible and, and possible. But there was one recently released for biochar, which is another uh, area that uh, at this point in time has not been touched so much, but that could show great potential as well, both in terms of, uh, you know, the scalability, the price points, as well as all the, um, the, the social development and uh, associated benefits. Great. Leah, thank you very much again uh, for your insight on this very complex material. And uh, thank you very much for your effort and uh, see you soon. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Have a nice weekend. Bye. Bye. -bye. Yes.